The passage of scripture for this evening is Psalm 149. I'll read the entire psalm. This is a psalm calling the church to praise God for his love to his people, to his people, his church. Hear now the word of God. Praise ye the Lord. Sing unto the Lord a new song and his praise in the congregation of the saints. Let Israel rejoice in him that made him. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. Let them praise his name in the dance. Let them sing praises unto him with the timbrel and harp. For the Lord taketh pleasure in his people. He will beautify the meek with salvation. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud upon their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand to execute vengeance upon the heathen and punishments upon the people, to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron to execute upon them the judgment written. This honor have all his saints. Praise ye the Lord. I have no doubt if we were to look into heaven at this very moment in time, we would see such praises given to God as we have never seen in our lifetime. John was given that opportunity in Revelation chapter 5 to get a view of the glory of heaven. And uh, angels were singing praises unto the Lamb. And all the people there in heaven were giving praise to the Lord. And so it is, a very heavy, it is a very heavenly exercise for us to give praise to the Lord or to give thanks to him. We are to be a thankful people. And we are to show our thankfulness by living holy lives. This psalm has to do with God's message to us here tonight. A call to us to worship. And by His grace to sing and to give praise unto the Lord. These last five psalms of the book of Psalms, Psalm 146 through Psalm 150, are called the praise psalms or the hallelujah psalms because in Hebrew the first word is the Hebrew word for hallelujah. And uh, thus they are psalms that are dedicated to giving praise to the Lord. This is an emphasis of the Holy Spirit upon giving praise to God, which declares to us, this, is it not our chief business in life to glorify God, and to enjoy Him forever, we ought to give praise to God throughout the day, no matter what life may bring. 
in that day, we should in all things praise the Lord. The reason that we should give praise to the Lord is that He is infinitely worthy of, of praise. He daily, the scripture says, loads us with his benefits, both spiritually and temporally. God should be praised because he is infinitely good. He is infinitely merciful. The word to praise God has somewhat become, I believe, a little bit too over-familiar to us to the point that some people almost flippantly just throw out the words, praise the Lord, without any substance or meaning or thought behind it. And so this evening, we should begin with asking ourselves, what does it mean to praise the Lord? One of the well-known concordances, Cruden, in defining praise, he says, praise is a confession and due acknowledgement of the great and wonderful excellencies and perfections that be in God. And having said that, how can we wrap our minds around it as finite creatures? How excellent is his perfections? How wonderful are his excellencies? We go to the Old Testament and we see how that when God had the temple constructed. Everything was constructed with purpose. And in the holy place there was uh, the incense burning continually. An incense that came up off the altar. It was never to cease. This was to indicate some believe to be the, the prayers or praise that uh, the people of God are to be constantly rendering unto him. We are to be incessantly, unceasingly in an attitude of praise. And this is by God's grace. This is not something that we can crank up in ourselves. As all good spiritual things which we have in Christ, they come to us by the grace of God. And as you hear these words, that you are to praise God without ceasing, I know it's your heart's desire to do that. Even when you're going through some of the worst times in your life. But you can, by the grace of God, be such a person. We just read Hebrews 13, 15. It says that we are to, and I'll reiterate it, you know the verse, I'm sure perhaps have memorized it. We are to offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, without ceasing, uh, just like the incense that came up off the altar. This Psalm 149 uh, is uh, a messianic psalm. That is, uh, it has that which points to Christ, the Messiah, our Redeemer, and the establishment of his kingdom. And it points to that, the establishment of his kingdom in the New Testament. Matthew Henry put it well when he says, this is a hymn of praise to the Redeemer. It is a psalm of triumph. 
in the God of Israel over the enemies of Israel. It was probably penned upon the occasion of some victory which Israel was blessed and honored with. Some conjecture that it was penned when David had taken the strong hold of Zion. That's where the temple was built. And settled his government there. But this psalm looks further than David. Matthew Henry goes on to say. This psalm looks to the kingdom of the Messiah. That is when the Lord Jesus becomes incarnate and establishes his kingdom uh, of the New Testament. Who in the chariot of the everlasting gospel will go forth in the last days conquering and to conquer. To him and his graces and glory we must have an eye. In singing this psalm which proclaims exuding joy, abundance of joy to all the people of God. And, on the other hand, abundance of terror to the proudest of the church's enemies. You remember in the Old Testament, there was a time when the children of Israel uh, were serving uh, the Lord and they were rejoicing in knowing that uh, God was going to give their enemy into their hand. And they were so exuberant in joy that the enemy could hear them afar off. And uh, it put trembling and fear into them. And certainly according as the word would have it, Israel overcame their enemies. One of the things that amazes me uh, about uh, the power of praise, if you want to speak it, of praise as power in that way, remember Jehoshaphat uh, uh, was uh, contending with five different other nations and together they allied and uh, they had uh, as their objective to as we've heard this before, wipe Israel off the map or at that time, wipe Judah off the map. And God told King Jehoshaphat through the prophet that he was going to defeat his enemies. And you know how they did it? They didn't have like special forces on the front lines and, and uh, they're next to the strongest uh, military forces behind them and and then to the weaker. On the front lines were the Levites, the priests, and the, those who played the musical instruments. And that front line, their duty was to sing loud praises to God as they went into battle. And God slew all five of those great nations, destroyed them. And so, goes to show how God is pleased to, in certain of his cases, as his sovereign will designs, victory through praise. Psalm 149 is such a psalm where we are to bring praise continually. I want us to note in verses 1 through 3 here that God calls the congregation of his people uh, to praise. That is, he commands us. Hallelujah is actually the, the translation in the, is actually the word in the original in Psalm 149. We translate it, uh, praise ye uh, the Lord. This is an imperative. That is, the people of God are being commanded to praise the Lord. Now think about it. Just think about, go back to the time of the creation. 
God said, let there be light. And there was light. He said, let there be a firmament. And there was a firmament. He said, let there be waters under the heavens. And God gathered uh, all the waters together in one place. And he created the earth. And everything that God commanded with his word, it happened. Now here's a command to us, each individual, throughout our life. God commands us in a fatherly and loving way, I might add. Praise the Lord. And may it be as it was said in Genesis, and it was so. And may it uh, continually to be so. We are to rejoice in these last days. There are a lot of people that look at these last days as uh, apoca apocalyptic days. Just There will be a destruction coming, yes. We know that. I mean, judgment day will come. But who knows when? No one. Uh, not even the Son of Man. But in the meantime... We are in the last days of which the prophets of the Old Testament spoke about. Which means the days of the Messianic kingdom, the Lord Jesus Christ is building his kingdom. And I, I've often said to people, I am so glad that God has brought me forth in this time and in this place. How much better it is for us, especially uh, if any of you are not Jews. <laughs> we are blessed indeed. We are in that time in which God is uh, taking forth the word of the gospel uh, to the Gentiles. So the Lord is building his kingdom. He's building his church. And though things may look dark and bleak, and there were dark and bleak times in Israel, uh, perhaps we are at the darkest hour before daybreak. It is all in God's hands. And if not, we still are to be praising the Lord. Now, God, in this first verse, uh, calls his people, to praise him with singing. I am amazed as I read the Psalms how many times God says to his people, praise ye the Lord with singing. And the thing that even uh, excites me even more, there's uh, in one of the minor prophets, it says that God loves his people so much that he rejoices over them with singing. I have never thought about that before when I had read that passage that God sings with rejoicing over his people. Can you imagine thinking about God singing? I don't think that is just metaphorical language either. He takes joy in his people. We ought to take joy in him. You know, Think about your happiest moment during the day when God has really touched you and spiritually and you're, you're thinking upon those things of the Lord. It's hard not to sing a hymn. It's hard not to sing a song <laughs> if your heart's really uh, in, within praising God. And this is what the call to people, the people of God is, is to uh, sing to the Lord a song. But notice it says a new song. I do believe that this new song is referring to the redemptive song of Jesus Christ. And we, we read about that. Look at the Revelation chapter 14, verses 2 through 3. As I say, when we visit heaven through Scripture, we uh, see 
all are taken up with praise and thanksgiving to God and particularly uh, to the Son of God as the Lamb uh, for his redemptive work to his people. But in Revelation 14, 2 and 3, the scripture says, And I heard a voice from heaven, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song. Now, doesn't it say here in Psalm 149 that we are to sing the new song? And here in the book of the Revelation, uh, it says that, what is this new song? A new song before the throne, before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song, but the 144,000, by the way, There's going to be more than 144,000 people saved. 144,000 here is a number used for a great number of people of the redeemed. And the new song that they are to sing is the song of redemption of the new covenant. His praise is to be in the congregation of the Lord. You know, coming here tonight, it, 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 I must tell you, uh, I am blessed, and, and it brings great joy to be here with you, especially to partake of the Lord's Supper. But to be in the congregation of the Lord uh, is, uh, I believe it's David in the psalmist, he, he says, is uh, the most blessed of all the days. Just paraphrasing there. And... Here we are together as the people of God, his body. And he is with us wherever two or three of us gather together for worship. And our coming together has a purpose. And one of those things, of course, one of the chief things is to praise him in the congregation of the saints. Now, we should be careful when we sing. That uh, we don't sing to be hearing ourselves singing so beautifully. Or nor should we sing because we hear someone else singing beautifully. We're to sing unto God. And to it's all about Him giving praise unto His name. As we read on in verses 2 and 3. Let Israel rejoice. In him that made him. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. Now, this is again pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ as the king of the people of God. The Israel certainly could speak of the true Israel of God as Paul says, uh, which are the elect of God. Now, praise, as I was mentioning earlier, must have substance. It must have content. What is it that's stirring up our heart to praise? And we're told here... <clears throat> That it is the person of God that caused it. When we think of the person of God and his attributes, that's what generates praise. He is infinite in his understanding and knowledge. He is infinite in all of his attributes, his love, his mercy, his uh, justice, goodness, and all of those glorious attributes. So when we sing, uh, we should be uh, singing to glorify Him. We are singing to Him. Let the children of Zion, that is the people of God, be, be joyful in their King. We oftentimes, and we should uh, chide ourselves a little bit, when we 
start feeling down because uh, the political scene is going, taking a dive or uh, things in this world, the government is taking a dive. We're told here in this psalm to rejoice. I mean, we rejoice when the government and things are going good in our land. But that's not really the content of our praise. It is to sing praise because we are rejoicing in our king. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. God is our king. The Lord Jesus Christ, with true human nature and true divinity, is king of kings and lord of lords. Whenever I start to get discouraged, more recently, I've been thinking uh, of the closing part of the Lord's Prayer. And it's something, sometimes we can go through the whole Lord's Prayer and not really think about what we've said because we know it so well. But that last phrase of the Lord's Prayer is, For thine is the kingdom. We look at men who are going to pass off the scene in a few decades as troubling the earth as though things will never get any better and that, and that, and that as though our joy depended upon the political situation. Our joy is spiritual. And it's rejoicing in our king. The kingdom belongs to God. He puts kings up. He brings kings down. And the proverb says that he takes the heart of the king and he moves the king's heart in whatever direction that he is pleased. And so what we are to rejoice in the substance of our rejoicing is to rejoice in who is the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. We don't have to wait until His second coming to be filled with joy and singing. He's with us now. He's in us. And we are too in His church amongst the congregation of the people of God. We are to be singing praises unto him. Let them praise uh, him uh, in the dance. The, this is uh, certainly uh, in Old Testament times. There were times when there was uh, Miriam and there was uh, uh, David that, you know, when you get so full of joy, your feet come off the ground. <laughs> I mean, uh, you witness that uh, when people, even of the world, go to a some athletic competition. And they're jumping up and down because somebody made a touchdown. The dance here, it speaks about that spontaneous joy. It's, it's not some choreographed dance, liturgical dance that some people are trying to introduce into the church. It's joy that causes one's feet to lift off the ground and it's done spontaneously as David when the Ark of the Covenant was being brought back. God loves to see his children rejoicing in him in that manner. Let them sing praises unto him with a timbrel and harp. We are, I cannot, well, I'm, I shouldn't say this. I, there's some, okay, uh, the scripture does say uh, here to use musical instruments to praise God. And so we are to use not only our voices, but even instruments as well. The second thing I would like for us to note here is that the Lord is to be praised because he takes pleasure in his people. Now, the reason God takes pleasure in us is not that we are so good or that there's anything in us. The Apostle Paul uh, told us of him, of his, own, his view of his own self in himself is that he is nothing. But 
we rejoice for he that is in us and for what he is doing in and through us. And so God takes pleasure in his people because what he is doing in and through them by his spirit and word and the Lord in us, what he is doing with us, his people, he is sanctifying us. And that is something to get excited about. That is something to praise God for. For the Lord taketh pleasure in his people. He beautifieth the meek with salvation. Now those uh, who come to know salvation must be humbled before God. They must be humbled for their sins. That's why John the Baptist told those proud Pharisees, I will baptize you when you come back and you show signs that are meet for repentance. When you humble yourself because of your sins, I'll baptize you. Not till then. And that humility that God works in his people by grace uh, is, is something that he takes pleasure in. And he will beautify those who humble themselves before him with salvation. And so, not only are we called in the first verse to give praise to the Lord, but in verse 5, it says, let the saints be joyful in glory. That is, uh, in the glory of God. When we understand the glory of God as it is revealed in Scripture, when it is preached to us from God's Word, and we rejoice in God and His glory and His glorious kingdom, that is pleasing to the Lord. We are even called to such praise. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud upon their beds. Now, <clears throat> as... Uh, we were saying earlier, we are to uh, praise God without ceasing. Have you ever had nights where you just couldn't get to sleep? If you do, think, start thinking about all the wonderful things that God has been doing in your life. It says here that you are to sing aloud upon your bed. The more we think about what God has done for us, the more uh, it will cause us to want to praise Him. You may not get to sleep. You'll start singing. Let them sing aloud upon their beds. But do reflect. Do reflect. Even upon your bed. Uh, the goodness of the Lord unto His people. And then lastly, we want to note here, uh, the Lord is to be praised because uh, he uh, empowers his people to overcome their enemies. I'll always remember the words of the Apostle Paul in the work of the ministry. I believe it was when he was ministering in Corinth. Uh, and he said that the Lord has opened many doors and effectual. I believe it was in Corinth where he said, to Paul, I have many people in this city. Corinth, that infamous place of wickedness, God had his people there. And so, we are to remember that God will always have his people and he will do his work wherever and whenever he pleases. So let us not be discouraged. He will enable us to overcome our enemies. But what Paul said as he was in Corinth, many doors and effectual have opened unto me. And then he said, but there are many adversaries. I know we pray for God's visitation, uh, perhaps a reformation or revival. And I, that's my heart's desire. 
But as God sends those things, it will come, no doubt, with suffering and pain and persecution while we're in this world. Remember, Paul said, great doors and effectual have been opened up unto me, but there are many adversaries. But the good news is, is that the Lord is going to enable us to overcome our enemies through the Lord Jesus Christ. Because God uses his people, he uses his church, to execute vengeance upon the wicked. Look at verses 7 and following. He has... Uh, the praises of God are in our mouths, and uh, we have the two-edged sword in the hand. For the purpose that we might execute, that God through us may execute vengeance upon the heathen and punishments upon the people. To bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron. To execute upon them the judgment written, this honor have all his saints. Praise ye the Lord. Beloved of God, we are soldiers of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are engaged in Christian warfare. We are the church militant. We have been equipped with greater armament than anything that the unbeliever has devised. And God, through us, and through faith, will use us to bring down the strongholds of the devil. to execute vengeance upon the heathen. God uses his people to do that. God said to Israel, I bring you into this land not because you are holier than any other people, but it's because the Canaanites are so wicked. And so God will use his people and the way that it will be done, it won't be done with the literal sword necessarily. God could use that means like it was tried in the Crusades. We, through the spiritual armor, bring down the strongholds of Satan. We have the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness. We have the shield of faith. We have the sword of the spirit. We're girt about with truth. At our feet shod with preparation of the gospel of peace. That is powerful. Paul, in writing to the Corinthians, uh, says that uh, the armor that he has given to us uh, brings down every high thought and evil thought against God to the bringing down of the strongholds of the devil. To see what the work of the gospel has done uh, as you look back over history, especially in those first 300 years when the church was very faithful, and look in the Protestant Reformation, how God had broken down kingdoms. The thing that makes the Protestant Reformation such a glorious example of God's power of bringing vengeance upon the heathen is that not only were saints trickling into the church out of the apostate church, but whole congregations were being brought out and planted in the Reformed Church. The church where John Calvin preached in Geneva was such a church. The whole church under the leadership of Pharaoh came in too. Protestant Reformation and many other churches and countries be 
because they desired to praise and exalt God in this life. And so let us be joyful in the Lord because He will use His people to bring down the evil uh, in this land. It is done with that spiritual armor. It is done uh, through the work of the gospel, which is mighty. Let us not be discouraged, but rather let us be encouraged because we know that God is much more powerful than any of our enemies. Psalm 139, and I close with this, verses 1 through 6 says, O Lord, Thou hast searched me and know me. Thou knowest my downsetting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down and art acquainted with all of my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, Lord, Thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before and laid Thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high cannot attain unto it. So God knows what's in our hearts. And what He wants to see is praise to Him, glorifying Him for His mercy, His justice, His goodness, His love. May God give us that grace continually to praise the Lord. As we read the Scriptures, uh, we will be in more inclined as we read the scriptures to begin that day with praising Him as we see the hand of God at work in His Word and His Word working through us. And so, beloved of God, let us heed this commandment this time and henceforth praise ye the Lord. Amen. Amen.